Section 3 starts with a quick overview of equity REITs and mortgage REITs. So as mentioned earlier, in a equity REIT, the REIT has a ownership stake in properties or a equity stake in different kinds of properties. In a mortgage REIT, the REIT essentially takes its assets and invests them in mortgages. A hybrid REIT is a combination of equity and mortgage, but these are not very common. Section 3.1 gives a background on REITs, and this is not very testable, so I won't spend time on it. You can read it if you want. It is interesting, but again, not testable. Section 3.2, again, is, I don't think, testable. It's a very short section on REIT structure. What the curriculum points out is that many REITs are structured as UPREITs, which refers to umbrella partnership REITs. And the high-level idea is as follows. We have a REIT entity. We have a partnership. The REIT owns the partnership and the partnership owns the properties. Now, the point of this structure is basically to give a tax advantage in that it helps avoid the recognition of taxable income if appreciated properties are transferred to the REIT. And again, the curriculum doesn't spend much time on this topic. There are no examples. So from a testability perspective, again, I think this is very low priority. Uh, the curriculum also mentions another kind of structure called a Dow REIT, which is simply a variant of the up REIT. But again, I would not get too hung up on this. Section 3.3 .3 is very important. This first talks about some high-level investment characteristics of REITs. One basic point that has already been made is that with REITs, we get exemption from corporate income taxes. So this is a good thing. The distributions to shareholders are relatively high. In fact, for this exemption to kick in, generally there are requirements that the income generated from the properties is distributed to the shareholders. So distributions are high. The third important point is that generally income volatility is low. However, the retained earnings for a REIT would generally be low. So since the money is flowing through to investors, the REIT investors, retained earnings are low. So if a REIT wants to expand by purchasing new properties or investing in new properties, then it needs to issue new equity. So given all these factors, essentially we can conclude that REITs are relatively stable, safe, investments and again this is relatively speaking so for investors who are looking for retirement income uh, they are look if they are looking for income producing securities REITs are generally a good investment now let's take a look at the advantages of publicly traded REITs and REOX over direct investment in real estate the first major advantage is liquidity. When you invest in publicly traded REITs or REOX, the liquidity of this investment is much more. Clearly, if you buy a expensive property, the ability to sell that property quickly at market price is relatively low. But in a actively traded public market of REITs and REOX, you can sell your shares and hence this is a relatively liquid investment. Another point is that the investment requirement is relatively low. Again, with a property that you buy directly, the level of investment needed will typically be high. But with REITs and REOX, you can get in with a relatively small amount. Third advantage is that the liability is limited. So when you buy shares, the most that can happen is that the share price comes down to zero. So you will not owe anything beyond that. Fourth point, quality and range. What this means is that through REITs, you can indirectly own properties, high quality properties, such as premium office buildings that you could not own otherwise. 
plus you also get access to a range of properties which again you might not be able to directly invest in fifth point with direct investment you need to either manage the property yourself or hire a agent a property management company to basically look after the property so you need to have some skill either in management or in picking the right management team with reits that is not an issue because the reit entity takes care of looking after the properties sixth advantage is diversification so this is obvious through a reit you can diversify into different properties across different regions and so on the next three points taxation earnings and payout these refer to reits so as we've already discussed there is a taxation advantage with reits where effectively we avoid the double taxation issue but there are some some criteria that need to be met for this taxation advantage to take place but generally reits meet those criteria so this is a advantage earnings are generally stable since the earnings or the rent that comes from properties is effectively paid out to shareholders after covering expenses there is a fair amount of stability and predictability in the earnings the payout ratio or the yield for reit investors is again generally high the advantage that reox have is operating flexibility the point here is that the income that is generated from properties does not or is typically not all paid out so we have retained earnings and those retained earnings can be used to make other investments so essentially operating flexibility is the major advantage that reox have over reits now i want you to work on example 1 Now let's take a look at some of the disadvantages of publicly traded REITs and REOX. Let's first look at taxation. When you own property, so when you have a direct ownership in property, then the losses, if you do make losses, those losses can be used to offset other gains or in other words those losses can be used to reduce taxes. Whereas in a REIT that cannot happen so that's a disadvantage second disadvantage is that the control of the underlying assets or the underlying properties is low the control happens through the reit management and as a shareholder you really don't have much control over the underlying properties number 3 costs here essentially the maintenance of a publicly traded reit can be relatively high so there is a question mark in terms of whether this high cost of running or managing the reit justifies the benefits of the reit the next point is that the prices of reit shares are determined in the stock market and these prices tend to be volatile if we compare the reit prices with the underlying nav or net asset value then the reit prices tend to be much more volatile than nav and hence at least on the surface the riskiness of reits is more relative to owning the underlying asset however this needs to be taken with a grain of salt because nav values or the values of underlying properties are based on appraisal data and as we have seen in the earlier readings the volatility of appraisal data is generally understated next point has to do with structural conflicts now as alluded to earlier many real estate entities are organized as up reits or down reits and there we have a concept of a partnership and a reit company now similar to the agency problem that you study in corporate finance here there might be some conflicts of interest between the partnership and the reit shareholders there isn't much detail on this so as long as you understand this at a high level that's all we really need next point has to do with income growth now given that the level of retained earnings is low the income growth is going to be low all the earnings or income that comes through from properties flows to the shareholders retained earnings low hence income growth low 
The last point has to do with equity issuance at disadvantageous prices. The point here is that REITs often use financial leverage. Now, if financial leverage has not been used properly in the past, that will make it difficult for a REIT entity to raise money in the debt market. Also, if we have a situation such as the 2008 financial crisis or credit crisis, here again, debt financing will be limited, which will force a REIT to go for equity financing, which again might be pricey or which might not be, which might not happen at suitable prices. So these are the high level disadvantages of publicly traded equity investments. Now you need to do example two. Section 3.4 provides some guidance on the sort of due diligence that an uh, investor should perform before investing in a particular REIT. The basic idea is fairly straightforward. When you are investing in any security, be it a REIT or even be it a stock of a company, you want to try and understand the specific characteristics of that investment, the possible opportunities and the risks. So here we talk about some aspects that you need to look at that are REIT specific, but you will clearly see parallels between what you need to do here and the analysis of a regular company stock. So the first point to look at is the lease terms. So these are essentially the REITs agreements with the customers. So in this context, the the entities that are leasing the properties are the customers. So we need to look at the lease terms. Are they favorable? How long are the leases? Whether the leases are up for renewal anytime soon? The next point is the extent to which inflation protection is built into the leases. So the way we can evaluate this is if the lease terms are expiring within a year, and subsequent leases give the REIT an opportunity to raise rents based on inflation, that gives inflation protection to the REIT. The company analogy would be that if a company, when it's selling its product, is able to pass on the impact of inflation to the customer, then we can say that that security has inflation protection. So same concept here. Point three has to do with rent. We should evaluate the current rent that is paid by tenants relative to market rents. Now, if the current rents are low relative to market rates, then that tells us about some upside potential in the future once rents catch up with market rates. Point four has to do with releasing costs. We need to have a good sense for how much it will cost the REIT to release. So the worst case scenario here is that leases are running out soon and then the cost to release the apartments is very high. Next, tenant concentration. So this would be analogous to studying the concentration of a given company's customers. Now, the situation that would be concerning here would be if you have a given REIT, again, let's just assume that this focuses on office space and there are two tenants who make up 90% of the revenue or the income generated for the REIT. Now, clearly this would be a reason to be concerned because the tenant concentration is very high and clearly not only do the tenants have significant bargaining power, but if these tenants leave, then that will have a serious impact on the cash flow for the REIT. Point six is competition. So who are the other players in the market? Again, let's take the office space building. So if our REIT is managing office spaces in three different locations, we need to look at the competitive forces in those locations. If in those three locations, several other players are coming up with their own office spaces that are potentially better than the ones that are under this REIT, that would be a cause for concern. This would be analogous to the internal rivalry force in Porter's five forces. Point seven is leverage. We need to look at the balance sheet of the REIT and look at whether there is reasonable leverage. 
if the leverage ratio is too high that would potentially mean excessive financial risk and finally we should look at the management of the REIT what sort of experience do they have how long have they been at this organization and so on so this obviously is analogous to the evaluation of the strength of management of a given company